Good morning, everyone. Uh, before we begin, can someone open us in prayer, please? <laughs> Father God, we thank you. We bless you for this day, Father. We submit each one of us onto your loving hands. Father, help us to know your will in everything we are doing, Lord. And uh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, um, apologize for starting late. Uh, we'll just continue from where we stopped yesterday. So I think we stopped at the Welsh Revival. Um, share screen. OK, so um, we were just looking a little more in detail at some of the uh, bigger revivals. Uh, and the main reason for looking at these revivals is uh, to observe like some of the some of the things that happened prior to the revival or during the revival, uh, things that we can take note of, things that we can learn from, um, whether good or bad, uh, for us to prepare ourselves as well for revival. Um, so. We looked at just two revivals yesterday. Today we look at, oh, we looked at three revivals yesterday. Today we look at maybe three more if we have the time. Uh, so 1904 was the Welsh revival. Um, so the Welsh revival because it happened in Wales. And um, uh, during this time, again, there was a spiritual decline within the church. So. Uh, there was not much church attendance. There were not many young people, especially in the church. And so um, there began to be some prayer uh, in the churches, praying to see a change in the, um, in the church, in the country as a whole as well. And uh, one of the key people in this revival was Evan Roberts. Uh, now, Evan Roberts was... A uh, very young man, but he had a deep desire to know God. So um, his heart was for God, and he was pursuing God personally. Like he wanted uh, to experience more of the Holy Spirit. He would spend hours and days in prayer, uh, just seeking God and desiring more of God, asking God to fill him with the Holy Spirit. Uh, and he. Um, Right from when he was a child, he attended Sunday school. He was memorizing scripture. Um, from uh, 13 years of age, he began to pray, asking for the Holy Spirit to fill him uh, and praying for revival for himself. Uh, when he was about 26 years old, he went away to Bible school and started to prepare for ministry. And during his time in Bible school, he felt this burden that he should be spending about seven hours a day in prayer uh, and in studying scripture. So uh, he committed himself to spending seven hours a day, every day, uh, seek seeking God, so spending that time with God. Um, so it was during this time that uh, he started to experience God moving in his life. And uh, there was an evangelist named Seth Joshua, who's also on the slide. Um, he had come to his Bible school and preached there. And um, the students, they were so impacted, they wanted to go to one of Seth's um, evangelistic meetings. And so they canceled classes at the Bible school and went to uh, one of these campaigns. And during that time, um, Evan Roberts experienced the Holy Spirit just moving powerfully in his own life. And he started to pray for 100,000 uh, souls to be saved. And he felt that God was going to do that uh, somehow. Um, so during this time, he uh, went back to his Bible school and felt 
uh, a burden for his home church. And so he asked his uh, school headmaster if he could go back and got permission to go back, spoke to his pastor in his local church. And his, look, his pastor was not very convinced that uh, he should give him a chance to speak. But he said, OK, after one of the meetings, you can just share with whoever's willing to stay back. And so after a prayer meeting, they invited people to stay back and listen to whatever Evan Roberts wanted to share. And this was specifically with the youth. Uh, so 17 people stayed back. This was October 31st, 1904. Uh, 17 people stayed back, and Roberts just had a very simple message. So he talked about confessing your sins, uh, making right any things that you've done wrong, putting away any, so if you're doing something in your life and you're not sure whether it's right to stop doing it. So putting away any doubtful habits, obeying the Holy Spirit, um, and then confessing uh, your faith in Christ publicly. So. He just preached that small message, but the uh, the youth there were really impacted, and all 17 of them responded to the gospel uh, in that meeting. So encouraged by that, the pastor also asked Evans to continue sharing. And so he shared for that week, and then he shared for the following week. And um, with that specific group of people, he also encouraged them to pray for the Holy Spirit. So he. Uh, led them in this prayer. He said, oh, send the Holy Spirit now for Jesus Christ's sake. <laughs> so they prayed that prayer. <laughs> and um, and people uh, experienced the Holy Spirit moving in that time. Uh, soon there were people coming from outside of town because uh, they were hearing news about the Holy Spirit moving here. Uh, it started to be published in the papers about what God was doing. Uh, so crowds of people were coming. The streets were filled with people because they were waiting to get into the church. Um, and one reporter uh, wrote in the newspaper, a strange meeting which closed at 4.25 AM. And even then, people didn't seem willing to go home. Uh, so, so through the newspaper also, news was spreading and people were coming in. <laughs> Uh, within the first five weeks, 20, uh, 000, between twenty to 30,000 people were saved just within the first five weeks of the revival, uh, apart from thousands of people who were revived in their faith. This twenty to 30,000 were new people coming to faith. Uh, within two months, 70,000 people were saved. And uh, by March 1905, which was three months later, 85,000 people had been saved, uh, were recorded as being saved. So we don't know how many apart from that. Uh, so during this time, there were other people who also started to help out with preaching the word, teaching. And most of it was focused on repentance, prayer, intercession. Uh, and through their ministry, what all was happening in the revival was kind of consolidated. So. They continued to preach and teach the word of God. They continued to uh, meet for prayer. Uh, they continued to intercede for people. And so um, though some of the pictures there are a few of the people who were involved in the preaching that was happening. Apart from them, there's also Evan Lloyd-Jones um, and also somebody named Sidney Evans. So uh, if you remember, the first thing that Evan Roberts uh, prayed for when he felt the Holy Spirit uh, kind of breaking through in his own life was for 100,000 people to be saved. And uh, he saw those 100,000 people converted uh, through this revival. So it was something that, like a huge vision that God gave him and God himself accomplished uh, through just someone who was so passionate for God. It was just his own personal passion for God that uh, made it possible. <clears throat> so there was also major social impact through this time. There was a reduction in crime. Uh, so judges didn't have much work. Policemen uh, didn't have much work. So they left their jobs and they. <coughs> <coughs> 
they joined uh, they actually started going to the church choir and singing in the church choir because they didn't have work to do um there was a reduction in drunkenness dropped to half uh, so pubs taverns were closed down because there were no people who were drinking um coal miners who were working in the area actually used to use a lot of bad language and they stopped using so much bad language in the time so much so that the horses that they ride didn't understand what they were saying because the horses were so used to hearing the coal miners uh, using bad language while riding so uh, just a huge impact on even transforming society um in 1905 evan roberts kind of uh the whole all the work that he was doing was a little too much for him to bear and so he uh, experienced some physical and emotional like a breakdown and then he withdrew from the revival but the work continued after that um so one of the challenges was that he had taken that work up like too rigorously and it had affected him and his health uh, so 20 years after the revival someone asked him if he thought wales could experience another revival and his answer was yes but who will pay the price um so just to talk about it involves a lot of sacrifice and um we look at as we are looking at what are some things we learn from this revival uh, one of the things being how to balance out how to get the kind of rest you need how to get the kind of support you need uh to avoid something like that where at the end of it you yourself are uh, completely um like you've lost your own health uh, and so he kind of withdrew from public life after this revival um but he continued to do work um in his own space um so some things we can learn from the revival prayer uh, so they had started praying for revival 7 years prior to when the uh, revival actually broke out a uh, complete surrender and this is from evan roberts own personal life uh, how he was a man who was completely surrendered to god um an uncommon vessel so Evan Roberts was not a big preacher or anyone important before God used him. He was just a young he was actually a very young person uh but because of being sold out for God God used him. Um holy spirit fruit so just recognizing that it was really a work of God it was not uh anything that was manufactured by a human being. Um and then one very important point is the fruit consolidated that is because those teams of people went out and continued uh to keep the people they were ministering to strong in the word in prayer uh, they continued to minister to people they were able to uh, strengthen what had been started they didn't kind of let it go and uh, dwindle off and so even 5 years after the revival took place um about 75% of the people who had come to faith continued to remain in the church so 100000 people were saved and 5 years later there were still about 75000 people in the church um so that's because they did a good job of uh, strengthening what had been started um next we look at the mukti mission so this is um what happened in india uh, with um uh, pandita ramabai so she was born in a brahmin family in 1858 and later became a christian um we are not looking too much at her own personal journey of coming to faith uh, but she started um a house called the sharada sadan a house of learning for brahmin widows so her experience was that her husband had died when she was very young and she saw how um, she was not cared for as a widow and she was uh, the practice at that time was that they would get married very young and their husbands would be much older so the husband would die and then the widow would be very young uh, and the widow didn't have much of a place in society there was no one taking care of them um and they were just basically very looked down upon and 
not taken care of. And so this burdened her. And so she started this home for uh, young widows. Um, by 1901, she had 2,000 girls uh, staying with her in Pune uh, in, as part of this home. So in the 1890s, there were people across India who began to pray for revival. Um, and in 1897, a student volunteer movement started praying uh, for, uh, started a day of prayer across India. Um, at this time, John Hyde, who had also come to India, had started these prayers, uh, prayers for revival. Um, so Pandita Rambai also wanted to see revival happen, and she started to talk about it. She had a letter that she used to write called the Mukti Prayer Bell, and she started to encourage people to pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. For about five years, she was writing in her letters about praying for revival and uh, started to spend time personally herself prayer in prayer and fasting. Uh, during this time, about 1,200 girls in the home uh, were baptized in the Holy Spirit in within two months. And um, as they heard about the revival in Wales and its spreading to Shillong in India, um, they started to desire to see that happen in their midst as well. And they uh, started to meet daily for prayer and uh, specifically praying for the power of the Holy Spirit to move in their midst. Um, in 1905, uh, when they were all gathered in prayer, uh, the Holy Spirit came in power and they began to, there was a lot of weeping, confessing of sins, uh, and um, more desire for the Holy Spirit. There was uh, speaking in tongues, dreams, visions, prophecy, uh, miraculous supply of food, um, the girls there felt that uh, the fire of God was consuming them. They felt like they were on fire. And uh, at this time, there's a record of uh, an American Methodist missionary named Minnie Abrams. So she recorded about this uh, experience that Pandita Ramabai had. She said, uh, Pandita Ramabai was woken up at 3.30 a.m. by one of the senior girls. She saw fire on one of the girls and ran across with a pail of water only to realize that it was not a physical fire. She saw all the girls on their knees weeping, praying, and confessing their sins. Uh, it was a baptism of fire of the Holy Spirit. The girls acknowledged that when the Holy Spirit came upon them, they felt burning within, sometimes almost unbearable. They were transformed and then filled with joy and praise. And so, um, so there are records of this, of just like a powerful um, evidence of the Holy Spirit in their midst, in all of these signs and wonders. Uh, and so they started to spend a lot of time in prayer and Bible study and started to send out teams of uh, people to preach the gospel. Uh, a team of 60 women would go out every day uh, into the villages to take the gospel to the surrounding, uh, to their neighbors and people around. Uh, we also looked at this earlier, how the Chile revival was impacted by this. So Minnie Abrams, who's here in that uh, picture on the screen, uh, she wrote a book about this whole revival and sent it to her friend who was ministering in Chile at the time. Um, her friend reading that book was so inspired that they started to pray for a revival in Chile. And uh, the Holy Spirit moved in Chile, and that led to the Pentecostal church being started there. Uh, so, uh, so this revival basically spread from here to Chile just because of that book and the accounts of uh, what God had done here in, uh, in Pandit Rambai's home. Uh, so just some things that we can take away from this. Um, there are major outcomes. Uh, so Alan Anderson uh, wrote an article about this, and he wrote some of the major outcomes. Um, that revival lasted in India for two years. Uh, this Mukti Mission revival lasted for two years, and it 
set the stage for the Azusa Street Revival, which started in 1906. So all of these signs and wonders that we saw here in the Mukti Revival uh, preceded what happened in the Azusa Street Revival. Uh, and they saw similar things happening there. Uh, women played an, a significant role in this revival. Uh, and um, in this revival also, there was much more openness to other Christians, to other denominations than we see in the other Pentecostal revivals. Uh, so these were just some things to note. Um, that was different from other Pentecostal revivals. So women playing a big role um, about inclusiveness, so other church bodies, other denominations being included, uh, and then how this impacted Chile as well. So uh, three things that we can take away from this revival is, again, prayer. Uh, Prayer was such an important part of revival breaking out, uh, stewarding the revival. So uh, although this revival had broken out, Pandita Rambai didn't actually start to tell people outside about the revival. Uh, it was happening inside Mukti Mission for a long time before they decided, OK, they'll start to send teams out and uh, go and tell other people about it because she wanted to protect what God was doing and they wanted to uh, kind of strengthen the girls themselves before sending them out and starting to tell other people about it um, and then spreading the revival so once they had done that they then took the revival to other places and started to evangelize and uh, share about what God was doing uh, so just those three things that we can take away from this revival. Uh, I think this is the last revival we we'll look at today. Uh, this is um, the Azusa Street revival. Uh, so this is a key revival in the starting of the Pentecostal movement, uh, the Assemblies of God Church. Uh, and... Um, one thing uh, that was written by Cecil M. Robeck uh, about the Azusa Street Revival is Azusa Street is a fountain that produced a global movement that has changed the face of Christianity forever. Uh, so what happened here uh, impacted the church worldwide uh, because of just this exposure to the Holy Spirit, how the Holy Spirit moves, uh, and how we can expect the Holy Spirit to continue moving in the church, which had stopped so much since the Book of Acts, right? Uh, for um, thousands of years, they have, we had not seen the Holy Spirit moving in that way. Uh, and so the Azusa Street Revival is very important because of that. Um, so we look at William Seymour. He was uh, born to uh, parents who were slaves in the US, uh, in, in Louisiana. And uh, he contracted smallpox when he was a child and lost vision in one eye. Um, during this time, he was conducting evangelistic missions uh, initially when he uh, came to faith. He went to a Bible college. Uh, I'm not sure if you all remember, we talked about Charles Parham, who had, um, he had started a Bible college where the students experienced the Holy Spirit moving. Uh, so that first Bible college closed down, and then he opened another one, which is where William Seymour attended. Uh, and so right in his Bible college, he was exposed to the Holy Spirit, uh, teaching on the Holy Spirit, about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, about praying in tongues. Um, and so uh, he learned about all of that, but he had not personally experienced it. Um, so uh, he uh, went to pastor a small church in California. And uh, as he was pastoring that church, uh, he uh, he was invited to travel to another another place in California. Um, and he, uh, at that time, heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and praying in tongues. Um, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm lost here a little bit. 
so he he was preaching about all of that uh, but uh, they didn't agree with what he was preaching about because he'd learned that in bible college so in this in his church they didn't agree with it and so they told him that he could no longer pastor the church uh, so he started a home bible study and uh, started to do that right from his house he started to teach in his house started prayer meetings in his house um, with about 15 african americans um, who were coming who joining with him during that time they experienced a powerful move of the holy spirit and they saw people who started speaking in tongues. Um, they actually even laid hands on someone. Uh, and that person was so filled with the Holy Spirit, he just fell to the floor as if he was dead uh, in that meeting. So during this time, uh, they, uh, they saw tongues uh, being one of the major things that were given to them. Um, but it spread within the groups. There was uh, his wife, she would also sing in tongues. Uh, he himself uh, experiences uh, the Holy Spirit coming and falling on him, and he fell on the floor uh, in the same way, fell as if dead, uh, and began to speak in tongues. So although until that time he had not experienced himself, he had been preaching and teaching about it. Uh, but during this meeting is when he also experienced it. Um, so more people started to hear about it and started to come to see what was happening. Um, they, uh, as the news spread, they were they would come uh, to these services to experience what God was doing. Uh, so they had, uh, so the church started to grow, and um, they were meeting in um, at Simo's home. They continued to meet there. Um, but April 18th uh, is when the Azusa Street uh, revival was reported in the newspapers. Um, so we'll read a little bit about that. Um, so he writes, one of the reporter who reported on it, he writes, prior to my meeting with uh, Pahim, I mean, Will uh, Seymour writes about meeting with Pahim, who was that um, the school uh, Bible college leader. He says, The Lord had sanctified me from sin and had led me into a deep life of prayer, assigning five hours out of the 24 every day for prayer. This prayer life I continued for three and a half years. When one day as I prayed, the Holy Ghost said to me, there are better things to be had in the spiritual life, but they must be sought out with faith and prayer. This so quickened my soul that I increased my hours of prayer to seven out of 24 and continued to pray on for two years longer until the baptism fell on us. Um, so again, we see as Evan Roberts as well, uh, there was this commitment to personally spend time in prayer and uh, to spend seven hours a day in prayer, which is uh, a huge, huge commitment. What is that? Yes. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just a huge sacrifice, right? Seven hours a day to spend uh, seven hours a day in prayer. Uh, so this is one thing that was very, very key in the Azusa mission, uh, was that there was a lot of prayer uh, that was happening apart from the actual meetings that were happening. So apart from the time he was spending preaching to the people, he was uh, praying outside uh, and spending time preparing him his own self uh, spiritually. And um, that was what led to even the Holy Spirit just guiding everything that he was doing. Uh, so John G. Lake um, described William Seymour this way. He said, God had put such a hunger into that man's heart that when the fire of God came, it glorified him. I do not believe any other man in modern times had a more wonderful deluge of God in his life than God gave to that dear fellow. And the glory and power of a real Pentecost swept the world. 
that black man preached to my congregation of 10,000 people when the glory and power of God was upon his spirit, and men shook and trembled and cried to God. God was in him. Uh, so people could see the Holy Spirit as he was preaching, as he was uh, ministering. They could see the power of God at work in him. Uh, and it was through his own personal spiritual life and through what he had allowed God to do in him uh, that other people were impacted through his preaching and through his work. Um, so uh, through this, uh, the church uh, started to impact other local churches in the area, uh, about 50% of African American uh, people. That congregation was about 50% African American. Uh, there were Latino people. Um, so it was a mix of a lot of different uh, people from different places, Japanese, uh, whites, Native Americans, uh, all of them coming and joining this church and being impacted uh, powerfully by the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, so within three months, uh, what they had started off with, uh, with about 15 people, had reached 500 and 700 people. Uh, and uh, in 1906, about 1,500 people had started to join uh, the regular services. Um, another thing was that this revival was very planned and organized. So uh, they had staff, they had volunteers, they had uh, membership, they had a statement of faith, they had a board of trustees, um, and uh, they had their own organization, they had a property that they owned. So there was a lot of um, a lot of organizational work that they had done. Uh, to continue the work that uh, they started. Uh, so they would have staff planning meetings on Monday mornings. And as the revival grew, uh, there were apostolic faith churches that were established, uh, and other congregations started to join uh, these Monday morning meetings. Um, they they appointed staff, so they had a state director, they had city evangelists, um, they had they had different people running different parts of the work that had happened uh, to continue that work and to continue to establish the work that had started. Um, spreading the fire. So evangelists who had uh, been empowered in this revival started to go out into other parts of the nation. So four, uh, four months after this revival, they started to go out into other, uh, other cities, other parts, and share about what God was doing. So South, uh, and then from there, they started to send out missionaries to other parts of the world, so South America, Africa, Europe, Asia. Um, the movement spread to all of these places, and it took root in uh, over 50 nations. Uh, and by 1914, uh, every city of America, uh, of 3,000 or more in every area of the world, so uh, all of these places had been affected uh, by this revival. Um, at the same time, there were challenges that they faced. So there was criticism of what was happening. Uh, so the media, newspapers, others who didn't understand what was happening um, were, uh, were critical of what was going on. Some churches who lost members, uh, they uh, were also unhappy about uh, about that, and so they were criticizing what was happening. Uh, some churches had to close down because they had lost members. Uh, and then local pastors also who didn't understand, they were not familiar with uh, the move of the Holy Spirit. Uh, they also wrote against the revival. Um, but one thing, uh, that was very sad was that uh, his Bible college leader, Charles Parham himself, visited the revival and then started to speak against it. Uh, and 
uh, also because there was a mixing of races. There were people from different races attending. Uh, that was something that was difficult for society to accept. Um, some people, because uh, they were seeing the Holy Spirit move in ways that they were not familiar with, they were uncomfortable with that, and so they started to uh, talk badly about it. Uh, and so all of these things were also challenges that were faced during the revival. And apart from this revival, it happens in revivals as well. Um, so the revival continued for about three years. Um, and it had been carried around the world. Uh, but because there was some challenges that they faced, it started to uh, kind of dampen what what God had been doing. Uh, so one of the leaders broke away and took many churches uh, with her, claiming that the revival had moved to another part. And so she uh, she kind of broke away from what was happening. Uh, there were other people who started to try to start the same revival in other places. So there was division that happened between the leaders. Um, and so the church kind of reduced and what that Azusa Street Mission Church uh, reduced to a small black congregation uh, rather than that diverse group of people that was meeting before. Uh, it just became a small congregation. Um, but Simo continued to be the senior pastor until his death. Um, and then uh, his wife served as a pastor after his death until she died. Uh, and then Finally, the mission was sold, and uh, yeah, it was that space was sold, and uh, that church didn't continue to meet after that. Um, so, just a few things that we can take away from this revival. Again, uh, William Seymour was not someone who uh, was an expected revivalist because. Uh, he, he was not a big preacher, not a well-known person at all, but God chose to use him. He was just uh, someone who was humble and who was personally desperate for God, and so God used him. Um, and the people among whom the revival started were an insignificant group of people. It was just 15 um, African Americans who were, at that time, um, very looked down upon in society, but God started to move in their midst. Um, uh, another thing was that they allowed the Holy Spirit to move as he pleased. So it was very spontaneous. They allowed whatever the Holy Spirit was doing, they allowed the Holy Spirit to do in their midst, uh, which was what allowed, um, allowed freedom in their worship and allowed God to move powerfully in them. Um, there was strong organization, right? So uh, they um, they were able to spread information through the newspapers. They were sending out evangelists and missionaries and doing outreach on the streets. <coughs> so, <coughs> so just good uh, organization, good leadership um, by William Seymour as well. Um, but eventually there was some breakdown um, and one thing that we can learn is to need uh, the need to guard what has been given so um, there was some jealousy pride greed strife that came into the leadership team uh, so it's important to be able to have leaders who are mature uh, to be uh, constantly guiding the leadership team and making sure that they are not straying away from the vision uh, of what y'all are doing as a, as a church. And uh, so that was what finally led to the church uh, breaking down and um, the church eventually closing as well. Uh, so we'll close with this. Um, we'll continue from chapter 6 next week yeah because of division uh, among the leaders uh, because they started to have fighting within or jealousy within uh, trying to lead away some of the churches 
uh, all of that led to a breaking down of the church as a whole. Um, okay, uh, anyone want to share any thoughts or any anything? Okay, then we'll close for today. Thank you all for joining. Thanks.